Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, glad you were able to make it out on a nice, cool, crisp morning. Uh, enjoy uh, having you here. Our, uh, most of the announcements are there aren't really any other than our special congregational meeting. So please stay because we've got just about enough for a quorum. We have, I think we have enough for a quorum, so we need you to stay if at all possible. Actually, I think it's 16 rather than 19 now. It's gone down a slight, but I think we've got either way. I think we've got it. So. I just counted 23. Yeah, so, so we, can't, we can't lose too many here. So we're going to just stay here. It shouldn't take us long, I don't think. Um, you never know. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, if you would, please stay. And then we do have coffee downstairs uh, following that. So. Um, are there other announcements or prayer concerns? Yes. Uh, I have an announcement. This Friday at 1.30, we're, we're going to make some lunch stuff. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, here or at no, the lodge? No, at the lodge, yes. Okay. Right. Good, good point. <laughs> like, you know, it's like the grocery list says one to three. Yep. What time is it? 1.30 at the lodge. Right. And um, right. we're... There to help the residents make some masa and eat it too. <laughs> Sounds good. Great, thanks. And we are starting something. We, we kind of had one earlier. Becky did about the uh, the prayer shawls. Uh, what we're calling mission moment. She'll explain that a little bit more when that comes up. That's going to be right before the text are read this morning. Let's stand. Are there other announcements or prayer concerns? Now, uh, Jeannie Fink, 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 right? Fink um, was in the hospital last uh, Sunday. I went and visited her after worship, um, but is now, in fact, at uh, the um, Eagle Ridge down in Osceola and recovering from a stroke that she had uh, some weeks before that. So um, she was just having a hard time getting nourishment, and so that's why the hospitalization, but it sounds like that's uh, come along soon. All right, let's stand and join together in our confession and forgiveness. A little bit frazzled this morning. Angie isn't here this morning, and uh, uh, we had a power issue for a second, only with that one outlet. So, one that I needed, however, really. <laughs> so, I've been running around a little bit. Let's join together in our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth. Wind sweeping over the waters. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have known you and have not always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant, renew your creation, restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come here. By the authority of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. Amen. Amen. Remain standing. I don't know, Becky, if you do want to run up. I, I've gotten the slides there. <coughs> um, but um, everything's in your, just in your hymnals, or there are words. We'll get there in a second. Um, I don't know, I fell in love with the songs this week. Some of them are newer, we've sung them all, uh, but uh, in pre we'll, we'll learn some of the choruses before we sing, it, sing them. This is a familiar one though, Christ Be Our Light. So join in as you. <coughs> I can't remember. Yep. Uh, Christ Be Our Light, the uh, last one.
Tony's going to play the chorus for us. We'll sing the chorus, and then we'll go back and do the verses. All right. Um, uh, you will probably hear some themes, uh, not only through the music, but what I am saying through the text <coughs> for today. There's, a, a, there's definitely a, a theme of light and darkness. Uh, you heard it in that last song. Um, and uh, the, uh, the way in which God comes to us um, throughout all of life. So I, I hope you hear that in, in all that we have today. All right, so let's hear the chorus and then we'll um, sing that chorus first before. And it's not on, it's not, not printed that way on the thing. So you'll maybe go down one and then come back to the verse, if you will. Um,
with the food shop in Chicago to help the schools um, for kids that may need food over the weekend. And so we um, started out with um, about 25 kids. We packed bags of food with two lunches, two breakfasts, two snacks, a fruit and a vegetable. And um, the children would then bring the bags home um, for the weekend. And many of you helped with the packing the bags and uh, the numbers of students have grown from, I think we started in the 20s and the start of the pandemic, it went up to 175 kids when the schools closed and they started offering breakfasts and lunches for the kids, they also added the weekend onto uh, the program. So um, it, it was a very big need that we helped to fill. Many of you also donated $2.50 um, per bag in the years. <coughs> um, and now um, that was, has been met with, with notes of gratitude from families and from students. And I remember one kid in, in particular who was so excited to be able to bring home food every week to help his family. And it just made him happy. And now the program is, um, has expanded to all of the schools in Chisago Lakes District. And um, although we are the only church and school partnership, the other churches are served through volunteers of the food shelf or through uh, family pathways. And um, we, we, the difference that, that we make in our very own backyard is, is a gift. And um, it is what we do here. We, we serve our neighbors and we love God. And this is a tangible way to show that love to our neighbors. Thanks, you guys. Psalm 126, and we will read responsibly. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who grieved. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. And then we said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. Like the water horses in the Nega. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed of sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Again he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. When he was alone, those who were around him along with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look but not perceive 
and may indeed listen, but not understand, and so that they may return, not turn again and not and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path that were that the <clears throat> where the word was sown when they hear. Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root and endure only for a while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, <clears throat> immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. He said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. For those who have, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. He also said the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow and he do, and he <clears throat> he does not know how the earth produces of itself first the stalk then the head then the full grain in the head but when the grain is ripe at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come he also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for him? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them. As they were able to hear it, he did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. <clears throat> thanks, Jerry, and thanks, Deb, for your words and for the work that you do with that. Appreciate that. I was just at a pastor's meeting this uh, past week, and the person that does the same thing for North Branch, uh, they uh, was speaking to us about that program that they have there. So it's a powerful, powerful uh, ministry that goes out through congregations and through the community. Lisa. I wanted to share too at um, our schools, they're working in elementary schools. It's always fun too because they kind of sneak these in the kids' lockers. A lot of times these kids will have a special ed kids struggles that get to share these up. So they feel pretty special because they get to put these on the lockers and prizes and stuff. So it's a great ministry in many ways. Yep. Thank you very much. It is cool. As you heard, uh, today we have before us a large portion of the fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel, which means, if you recall, we were in the second chapter last week, which again means that we pretty much skipped over all of chapter three. It's understandable in the fact that three is a lot like number two. It tells us more about what Jesus was doing, you know, just everyday stuff, healing more people, casting out demons, uh, feeding people, and, you know, that kind of just everyday stuff for Jesus. Um, we also hear there that he finalizes his group of 12 disciples and that he goes home. But the question is home, not to Nazareth, but to apparently his new home, which is now in Capernaum uh, by the sea or the lake of uh, Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret, both the same. 
But before teaching the crowd the parables that we have before us that you heard today, Jesus is accused of blasphemy. He is called Beelzebul. So it's uh, not associated with the gift of the Holy Spirit, but rather with the spirit of Satan. As you can then understand, the, the tension is building. It's ramping up even more so uh, in the third chapter. So now we move to this fourth chapter where we have these parables that Jesus is telling us. Let me ask you this. What's the difference between a fable and a parable? Between a fable and a parable? Uh, that question is important as we move through Mark's gospel, especially in the parables that he teaches here. Fables um, are more intended to educate, aren't they? They're a clever story that are meant to give some insight or instruction about life. I mean, think about the fables that you give to kids, right? I mean, they, they give good advice or they teach them some practical lesson that will help them, some moral lesson that will guide them. Uh, I mean, who of us doesn't, hasn't heard or doesn't know the lesson of the tortoise and the hare, right? S slow and steady gets you through, right? Or uh, boy cries wolf, honesty is what? best policy, right? Uh, we, we've got some of those lessons. A parable, on the other hand, isn't meant necessarily meant to teach in the, some, in the same way, and especially that's true for Jesus' parables as we have before us today. More so, the parables are meant, unfortunately, to disrupt us, to interrupt our lives in a way, interrupt what we think we know or think we knew, and to confront us, surprise us, so that we uh, come to a, a new understanding of what is true. Parables are useful to uh, help that, in that way to disrupt us, to help us deal with difficult things we don't want to hear, to help us to understand things that we don't quite comprehend but aren't willing to really go there, or uh, believe in some of those things. So that's kind of the, the idea of a parable. Jesus himself kind of understands that, doesn't he? He quoted Isaiah chapter 6, justifying why he's teaching in parables that people won't understand. Paraphrasing Jesus and his paraphrasing of, or quoting of Isaiah, he's basically saying, look, um, some will look and listen, but they will not understand or see. Basically, he's saying they won't get it, right? They won't get it, not at first at least. Now, I, I want you to hear that clearly um, uh, in that I don't believe that Jesus is saying in, in order for us to believe, we have to somehow get it, that we have to be in the right place, that we have to understand completely. Because if that were the case, especially in Mark's Gospels, they'd all be out, right? Because in the end, none of them get it. That is especially true as they are dealing with a God who sends God's only Son to die on a cross. It doesn't make sense. And then to be raised from the dead? They don't get it. They can't understand. What we start to hear in today's uh, describing of Jesus' parables is that it's going to make people go, huh? Right? And that's his intention. It's an unexpected um, and hard to fully understand teaching about what God is doing. And that's the problem, is it is very difficult to understand at times what God is doing. So we use these parables to help get a start on that. I like the way Eugene Peterson, some of you know him, he did a transliteration of the Bible called The Message. Anybody have seen that? Uh, it's great. It's a great um, kind of Bible narrative, uh, if you will. But he, his talking about the, his um, thought about the parables are that they are narrative time bombs. <laughs> I love that image because it's. I mean, you hear the parable, tick tick. You wonder about it, tick tick. You think you may have got it, and then you realize, no, tick tick. You think about it some more, and you walk away, tick tick. And over the course of a day or so, tick, tick, maybe suddenly a truth, a truth that God wants you to hear or Jesus wants you to convey to you, it strikes and boom, it's there, right? 
It blows your mind as you start blows your mind as you start to comprehend what Jesus was talking about. So maybe what I really should do is just uh, read the text again that uh, was read for us and that Jerry read for us and, and uh, let's set the timer and just let it go for the <laughs> If you want something from me, don't you? You expect to get something you want to make me to earn my keep. Okay, so here we go. Um, before looking at uh, some of the pairs, these parables more closely, let me ask you this. Does there seem to be an overarching theme in this mostly agrarian, in the mostly agrarian parables that we heard today? I think there was. Would you agree with me uh, in this statement that growth happens? It seems to be an overarching kind of thing in most of the stories, right? Growth happens. That is, there, there is in the end some bursting heads of grain, beautiful flowering plants, and in the end, there will be a harvest, right? Now think about that. Think about that, because if you think back, you put God into the equation, wasn't it God who planted all of those seeds, right? It was God who planted that crop. And so the promise that I hear in that is that if there's going to be a harvest, God is going to succeed in bringing home that harvest. We should have some bringing in the sheep, right? God's kingdom is coming. We heard that at Jesus' baptism. God is on the loose. Jesus is on the loose. God is near. God's kingdom is coming, and it's coming after you. In the end, God will win. <laughs> Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I think it does. So let's look at this first parable about the sower through that lens. I fear too often, however, and um, I remember being at seminary in my first preaching class. This is the parable. I think they do it purposely. purposefully. This is the parable they give to every incoming first year student at seminary. I don't know if that's still true. And we all blew it terribly. <laughs> because why? When you read that at first glance, what do you say to yourself? I should be good sir. Good, sir. Right? And if we just pull up our bootstraps, and work hard enough and be attentive enough, we can somehow make ourselves into good soil, receptive soil to <clears throat> receive the bounty of Jesus' word for us, right? The good seed. What's the problem? How much of the time are you good soil? I'll speak for myself. Very little. Am I really good soil? I can identify with the others much more. And in reality, if it's about me making myself good soil, or you, do you need Jesus? Not really. Because you're good soil. God's going to plant it, and it's going to grow, and good, you're good. I need Jesus. <laughs> I can't speak for you. Well, yes, I can. You need Jesus, too. <laughs> So if the parable is actually more about God than us, then what does that parable look like? Well, who's the sower? Well, the who's this farmer who leaves the barn and starts throwing seed before he barely gets out the door? Crazy, right? That sounds a lot like our God. We have a God who is crazy in love with you. And not only you, but all y'all, the whole of creation, right? God is rich in love and mercy, and God will pursue you until your dying breath, and I believe beyond. That's a perfect image of who this sower is, willy-nilly throwing out the seed. So what is the seed then? Well, in the explanation, it says the seed is the word, right? Well, who is the word? John's Gospel, at least we say, Jesus is the Word made flesh who dwells among us. 
So if God is the sower and Jesus is the seed that, seed that makes all of us the soil, right? All of us. Again, not all of us just here, but all of God's creation. And Jesus is broadcast, again, willy-nilly, everywhere that God can imagine. Spreading that good seed of the word, the good news of what God has done for us that is really incomprehensible to us. So doesn't that make this parable about our complete inability? Our complete inability to control the coming of God's kingdom, to, de to, to dictate whether we or others believe or not. It's out of our hands. And for some of us, it's hard to, to, to agree with that. It's hard, it's uncomfortable, because that leaves us more vulnerable than we like. God's kingdom comes apart from our efforts. It cannot be controlled or influenced. It is simply a gift for us to receive. So in that sense, faith is a lot more like falling in love than it is than making a decision, isn't it? I mean, did you walk out one day and go, I'm going to find my partner today? <laughs> Maybe some of you did, I don't know. Um, but it's more about being in a situation where all of a sudden love finds you, right? And you can't help it. It's beyond our effort. It's something that comes from outside and grabs hold of us, whether we want it or not. And for me, that makes a whole lot of sense, especially as I read not only Jesus' parables, but the whole of Scripture. It is about God coming to me, to you, to God's creation. It is about God's grace over and over lavishing, being lavished upon us. God's grace then is the seed, I, I love the image, God's grace is like the seed that that farmer, you heard the, one of the parables, he throws it out, goes to bed, and what happens? Wow! He sees it sprouting, how, how did that happen? <clears throat> Can you imagine farmers every year going, what the heck, how did that happen? Right? I was talking to somebody the other day. Actually, I was listening to somebody that, you know, probably Craig or others, but they have created, you know, I mean, seeds that are planted, you know, even those little ones, they're apps making machines that can put one seed in every spot, right? Is that right? It's incredible. Can't even walk through cornfields deer hunting anymore because those they're about this far apart, right? It's amazing. God's grace is like that seed, uncomprehensible to us. And God's grace is like the mustard seed we heard, which really isn't the smallest of seeds that, as it says. That doesn't matter. We don't worry about the factual part of it. It's a parable. But it really doesn't need to be planted. Why? Because it's a weed. <laughs> and most farmers don't even want it in their fields, right? Am I right? Great, yeah. Got a few farmers. It's a pesky weed that they try to keep away from their fields, which makes it even more impressive to me in the image is that it invades us even when we don't want it to. God's word comes to us. It captures our hearts even when we don't have any control over it. And that's where this parable really takes on special meaning for me because let me ask you this, raise your hand if you have ever been the hard to penetrate soil that is not receptive to Jesus. Okay, yeah, I know. Raise your hand if you've ever been like that rocky ground where you've heard the good news of Jesus and jumped up with joy and then, oh, that joy just didn't last. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been to a retreat or camp in the summer, right? That's what that's like. Oh, wow, we got to do this, we got to do this, it's great. You know, people come back from workshops, we got to change the church, right? About a month later, yeah, that program's dead. That's all right. I've been this third one, probably more, how many have been thorny ground, letting the cares and the world, the lures of wealth, the desire of other stuff, choke out Jesus and push him away. I think we've all been there. I do know, because I've witnessed it myself, you have been good soil. 
you have allowed God's Spirit to move in and through you and affect the world around you. We heard a good example of that this morning. The wonder of all that for me is what? Is that Jesus, through it all, was there. In all of those situations that I have been, that you have been, in all those different types of soil, Jesus was there, sown in each of us still, through the good, the bad, the ugly. Jesus, the Word of God, cannot and cannot be stopped from being sown in you and me. In these parables, Jesus remind us, reminds us that the kingdom of God comes of its own, and it comes to us and for us. We are God's crop. As I said earlier, God will bring in the harvest. God will win you over. So let us have ears to hear and hearts to rejoice in that good news. Amen. Sing the chorus again, like we did earlier. We've done the song, like I said before, but it's been a while, I think. But if you don't hear in the words of this song what I just said, you're not paying attention. <laughs> Let's uh, hear the chorus and then we'll sing it and then we'll go back and, and sing the uh, verses here.
Let us receive our offering. Trusting God who raised Jesus and who will raise us in spirit and truth, 
We remember all who have died and are at peace among the saints. I think especially this weekend of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who faithfully ad whose faithful advocacy for peace and justice continues to embolden your church. God of grace, we see our prayer. Knowing the Holy Spirit indeed intercedes for us, we offer these prayers in the silent prayers of our hearts. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the God who names you, Christ who claims you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, bless you and remain with you. Always. Amen. Closing him, I think, is fairly familiar to you. So we'll just uh, start right at the beginning.
so we can get to coffee. <laughs> yes? Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Becky Holden. I am um, just newly elected as uh, pre uh, president of the council. And so I'll lead us through this special congregational meeting. Uh, so thank you for staying. Thank you for coming out on this uh, cold morning. It actually is winter. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew we could have winter here in Minnesota, huh? And it even got Joe up this morning. Woohoo! <laughs> Yeah. All right. So um, the notice of 